Please be seated. Um, the Security Self President and Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We are back on the record in C250966, David Adams versus Thomas Randolph. Say the record, Mr. Randolph, the President is Attorney, Deputy Attorney on behalf of the state. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry, I do want to apologize for the delay this morning. We did have some issues that we had to resolve outside of your presence. It was necessary for us to resolve those issues so that we didn't have to take up any more of your time this afternoon. But I do appreciate your patience, and I just want to apologize to you. No one here was in any way thinking your time wasn't valuable, but we had to get that resolved so we could go forward this afternoon. <coughs> state, are you prepared to call your next witness? Yes, Your Honor. The state calls Clifton Miller. <coughs> You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be that. Thank you. Please be seated. Clifton R. Miller, C L I F T O N M I L L E R. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Miller. How are you? I'm fine. Um, sir, back in 2008, were you uh, living in Las Vegas? Yes, I was. Did you um, know someone um, by the name of Michael Miller? Yes. W are you related to him as like a family member? Yes, my cousin. Cousin? Is that yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, were you and Mr. Miller um, approximately the same age? He's about 10 years older than me. 10 years older than you. When, um, when do you uh, recall Mr. Miller coming to Las Vegas? Right about December. December of 07? Yeah. Okay. Um, when he came to Las Vegas, did he live with you? No. Stay with my aunt and uncle. Your aunt and uncle? Yes. Okay. And... Um, are they uh, Billy and Vita Miller? Yes, sir. Uh, you were another family member that was out here in Las Vegas? Yes. Okay. When Mr. Miller um, came to Las Vegas, um, did you ever do any social things with him, like go out to dinner, that yeah, kind of thing? Yeah, we hung out. Okay. How frequently do you think it was that um, y you guys would go out, like every weekend? or Every other weekend. Okay. Maybe twice a month then? Yeah. Okay. Um, did... Uh, at that time, did you have, uh, were you working detailing cars? Uh, I had, that was my job I had on the side. Okay, you had multiple jobs. Yeah, I had two jobs. Okay, was one of your jobs doing detailing cars? Yes, it was. Um, did Michael Miller ever come to work with you and help you do that? Yeah, every now and again. Um, was he a good worker? Did he work well with you? Yeah, I mean, I had to teach him everything, but he did, did well. Okay. Okay. Um, at some point while, uh, while you were working with him or socializing with him, did you learn that he was um, associating with a person by the name of Thomas Randolph? Yes. And did you have um, any understanding as to whether there was a difference in age between Mr. Randolph and your cousin, Michael? Yes, he told me he was an older guy. Older guy? Um, I don't want to know... Well, actually, let me ask you this first. How, how soon after Michael's arrival to Las Vegas did you start hearing about uh, Mr. Randolph? It was about two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah. So that would be early January of 08? Yeah, about two, about two weeks in. Okay. Um, and I'm kind of looking for a yes or no question here. Was it your understanding that um, Mike was working as a handyman for Tom? That's what I was told. Okay. Um, did you did you have a different did you have a different basis of knowledge to know that that wasn't actually what he was working yes. as? Okay. Um, and would you describe your cousin as a person who's like a handy person who knew how to build things? Definitely not. Okay. Um, was it your understanding that your aunt and uncle believed that uh, Michael was working as a handyman? They did. When you um, had conversations with uh, your cousin Michael, 
um, I don't want to know the content of the conversations, but did you ever advise him to stay away from Tom? Yes. Would that have been on one occasion or multiple? Multiple. Um, do you have any sense of how often Michael and Tom would communicate based on your interactions with Michael? Several times a week. Had, uh, ha do you recall Mr. Randolph or Tom ever using your cell phone in order to get a hold of Michael? Yes, one time. And um, I assume you just passed the phone over to your, your cousin? He wasn't with me at the time. Okay. Did, um, did your cousin Mike ever express to you sort of towards the end of his life that he was going to come into some money? No, I didn't think he expressed that to me. Okay. Um, did you ever um, advise your cousin against house sitting for Tom? Yes. Um, did you do that pretty strenuously, like that's not a good idea? Uh, every time I talked to him, I told him I wouldn't do it. Okay. Did you ever suggest to your cousin or warn him, um, telling him that you thought he might get shot? Yes. Did, um, well, let me ask, ask you this. Was there a point in time when you kind of pulled away or, or started spending less time with your cousin? Yes. And would that have been in the... Towards the... Uh maybe a month before he was killed. Okay, and was that because of his relationship with Tom? Most definitely. Um, you had a, a girlfriend at that time? Yes, my um, children's mother. And she didn't want to hang out with Michael anymore because of the relationship? She didn't want me hanging out. Okay. When you, um, when you were around your cousin, Mike, did he ever appear to you to have a lot of money? No. In relation to Michael's death, how long before that was the last time you saw him in person? Uh, saw him in person it was about a month okay. before. And when was um, sort of the last time you spoke to him, if you recall, in relation to his death? I want to say about at least two weeks. About two weeks? Yeah. During that conversation, um, were you under the impression that he was still hanging out with Mr. Randolph? He told me exactly they were out right then. Okay. Did you um, did you hear something that indicated that suggested to you where they were at? Yeah, shooting. Like a shooting range. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say a range, but it was somewhere shooting. Okay. Um, in that conversation, how did how did that end between yourself and um, your cousin? I told him basically I was disappointed he was still hanging out with the guy, and I hung up on him. Okay. Courts indulgence. Thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Cross. Freeze. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Fair to say that you have, you told police that you never actually seen, you never actually physically saw no. Thomas Randolph at all. And, never. And you never saw a woman named Sharon Randolph, did you? Never. You advised against house sitting, is that right? Yes. Because you learned that maybe he was going to house sit. Is that right? That Mike was going to house sit for Thomas. I advised against it because if anything is no, I didn't ask I you why it. you advised against it. I'm saying that the re you advised against it, and that was because Mike said that he may be house sitting. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Did out at the shooting range, you didn't like Mike out at the shooting range. Did you say, do you remember talking about you were concerned about people with scopes and rifles and do you remember saying anything like this? No. Okay. You were frightened that he was out there shooting uh, in the desert with Thomas and you didn't like that. I didn't like that. But you never met Thomas, right? Never. And you never met Sharon? Never. Did you also at one point uh, learn that Thomas had a lot of guns in a safe? Yes. Nothing further. Nothing, uh, nothing else, Sharon. Thank you. This is the very gentleman the jury have any questions for this witness? Okay. Seeing no response. Sir, you are excused. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you.
Next witness, Your Honor, is Jennifer uh, Brown. Jennifer, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R, Brown, B-R-O-W-N. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, how are you employed? I am a forensic scientist with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department Forensic Lab in the DNA section. How long have you worked as a forensic scientist for Metro? 16 years. And what is your educational background that allows you to work as a forensic scientist? I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in Molecular Biology from the University of California, San Diego. And um, when you started working for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, was that the first forensic lab that you worked at? No, I previously worked at the Arizona Department of Public Safety Forensic Lab in DNA for six years. Okay, and as someone who works in the DNA lab um, in Arizona or for Metro, what does that mean that you do on a day-to-day -day basis? As a forensic scientist in casework, um, some of the responsibilities include analyzing evidence, examining them and looking for um, blood, semen, saliva, anywhere where DNA might be deposited, including areas where someone may have drank out of something or touched something or wore something, um, and then taking that on and getting a DNA profile, and then comparing those profiles to a known standard or known standards in the case, writing a report, and then possibly testifying in court about it. And how many times do you think you've been called upon to testify as an expert in the area of DNA analysis and comparison? Um, probably about 20 in a district court and 30 total with grand jury and other things. Okay. Um, you were working in the same capacity back in 2008 and 2009? Yes, I was a casework analyst back then, yes. Okay. And do you actually have a different position now within the lab? Yes, I'm currently a database DNA analyst, so I run DNA samples every day on arrestee samples in the state or in the southern Nevada area. Okay. Back then you were doing casework, meaning um, dealing with evidence that was impounded by crime scene analysts and that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. Um, can you just give us an overview before we start with um, the actual testing and analysis that you did? Can you give us an overview of what DNA is? Yes. Uh, DNA is like a genetic blueprint for life. Um, it's inherited from your parents, so it's the way information is passed on from generation to generation. It's in many cells throughout your body, and you get half your DNA from your mom and half from your dad, and it's unique to individuals with the exception of identical twins. Okay, and so if I understand your answer that you just gave, um, a person's DNA profile is um, part of what they inherit inherit from their biological mother and biological father? Yes. And are those uh, profiles unique amongst um, different people? <coughs> yes, with the exception of identical twins, they are unique to okay. each individual. What are um, good sources uh, of DNA profiles uh, for forensic scientists like yourself? Um, body fluids are excellent sources such as blood, saliva, or semen. Um, you can also get things um, off something somebody wore, so skin cell contact on things, um, and touch DNA such as holding on to items or um, um, opening items and things like that. Okay. And it, you mentioned touch DNA. If you touch um, a particular surface, um, does that necessarily mean that someone could later come by, swab that surface, and um, develop a DNA profile from it? Not necessarily. It's going to depend on how much DNA uh, you leave in that contact. If you have just kind of a brief contact with something, like maybe you're walking through the door and you touch it briefly, you might not leave very much DNA behind. But if you are, say, opening a jar of jelly or something and you're, there's force and friction involved, you might be uh, more likely to leave more DNA behind. Okay. And is that, um, that, that would be like with touch DNA. Are there factors that affect whether or not you're able to get... Um, 
a DNA profile off an item of evidence in a crime scene, um, say blood or something like that? Are there environmental factors or things like that? Yes, things, um, things can be degraded um, sometimes and also, especially with touch DNA, if you imagine that door over there and we tried to swab it, there would be a lot of, a lot of DNA on there and that would be difficult to get a DNA uh, profile that we'd be able to make any conclusions on. Okay, so in, in the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department lab, um, the work that you were doing back in 2008 and 2009 would be taking um, items of evidence that had been impounded and seeing if a DNA profile could be um, generated from an item of evidence that maybe had blood on it or something? Yes. And then how, how are known profiles of individuals um, developed? Like what is a buckle swab? So a buckle swab is just, and the buckle is B-U-C-C-A-L. Um, it's just the inside skin cells of your cheek and um, that's how we get most of our known standards these days is we take, they take swabs of um, the cheek swabs of people and that's how we get our standards. So if you take a, a buckle swab of an individual, um, that profile would be the same um, as if you, like say you had the blood sample of an individual. The profile of each person is the same whether the source would be a buckle swab or like blood or something like that? Yes. Um, typically I think you said that the uh, samples are uh, in the form of buckle swabs because that's probably an easier sample to obtain? Yes, uh, it used to be blood, but it's more, less invasive and it's m more common these days. Okay, um, and so from a buckle swab you get um, a known profile identified to a particular individual? Yes. Okay, and then you can compare those known profiles to uh, the profiles developed from items of evidence if you're able to get a profile? Yes. Okay, um, and is that sort of the work that you were doing back in 2008. Yes. Can you explain for the members of the jury, like when you were doing that, like what happens? How does the piece of evidence even get to you in the lab in order to do your work? So when we get a request, it's usually from a detective, um, and then we will call up the evidence. The large evidence vault is off site, so we call the evidence up and they bring it to us the next day, and we get it from our evidence technicians in the lab. Um, they, they store it in a secure location and then they, get, they transfer it to us in the computer and then we put it in our own lockers that are locked. Okay, and then um, when you get it from your locker and, and you're developing um, or seeing if you can develop a profile off a particular item of evidence, are you actually like taking a swab of the blood or how, how is that typically done on evidence items? It could be um, either way. You can take a cutting of the samples or you can take a swab. And then, um, then you're comparing that to um, standards or known buckle swab uh, profiles? Yes. Okay. Now, in this case, um, who did you have known samples from? Like, who did you have the buckle swabs from? Uh, Sharon Randolph, Thomas Randolph, and Michael Miller. Okay. So for each of those three individuals, you had a known DNA profile from them in the form of a buckle swab? Yes. And then um, you were asked to compare those with various items of evidence to see if to see if you could find the source of the DNA or exclude them as a source. Correct. Um, did you in um, in working on or working with the evidence on this case? Did you do you sometimes take uh, photographs of the evidence? Sometimes, yes. Um, may I approach your honor? Yes. I'm showing with you what's been marked as state's proposed. 329. Do you recognize that photo? Yes. Mm -hmm. And for example, here, I'll just do it for you. Yes. Are all of the these photos um, in this uh, packet photos that you took as you were working with evidence um, in this case? Yes. State moves to admit 329. Any objection to 329? No, you are. 329 over so in order to um, do your work, does, uh, is a request made by uh, usually a detective for you to do a comparison with certain items of evidence? Yes. Um, and in this case, um, did you do two separate reports? Yes. And did it contain different items of evidence on each um, request? Yes. Okay. I want to start um, with the first one, and I'm going to put on the overhead um, states 329. And it looks like we're looking at, um, well, you tell me, what are we looking at? <laughs> uh, a pair of gloves. Okay. And so this was one of the items you uh, examined for the presence of DNA? Yes. 
Okay, and what, what part did you concentrate on, if you recall? Um, I examined the two gloves, and I noticed on the left glove there was some red-brown staining, and so I did the testing on those. Okay, I'm going to flip to the second page of this exhibit. What's depicted in this in these two photographs? Uh, the areas on the glove that I did the sampling and testing on. Okay. And what were your um, what were your findings with regard to these gloves? May I refer to my report? If uh, with the court's permission. Yes. So for the the left glove, um, I did some preliminary testing um, for blood. It's a, a chemical test, and they indicated that there, uh, the three stains that I was looking at could be blood. And so I took swabbings of those samples, and I took them on for DNA. And I obtained partial and full profiles that were consistent with Michael Miller. Now, in, in your testing, um, do you ever uh, have indications that there is more than one person's DNA um, from an item of evidence? Sometimes, yes. Okay. In this particular case, was there an indication of that or just a single source profile? It was just a single source profile when I was testing. All I tested was the stains on the glove. Okay. And I believe I heard you say that those blood stains were consistent with Michael Miller? Yes. In, in your work as a DNA analyst, do you um, generate statistics or give some sense of how rare his DNA profile is? Or how do you contextualize your results? Um, in this case, at the time, when we had an item of evidence that was believed to have been taken off of a person, something they wore, we were not doing statistics at that time with those particular items. Okay, fair enough. So the profile you get from the blood, you compare it to the buckle swab profile from Michael Miller, and it's consistent? Yes. Okay. Did you also, um, I'm flipping to the next page of that, uh, exhibit. Did you also examine um, a red sweatshirt? Yes. And what were your findings with regard to the sweatshirt? I tested uh, six areas of staining on the exterior of the sweatshirt. Um, they all presumptively tested as positive for blood. And I got full and partial profiles that were consistent with Michael Miller. So I want to just zoom in just a, a little bit on this exhibit. Um, there's some circles on the um, red sweatshirt. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, and is that indicating areas where you took sampling from? Yes. Okay. And if I understood your last answer, the profile that you got from this red sweatshirt um, for blood was consistent again with Michael Miller? Yes. In, um, in addition to, oh, well, actually, let me just show you the next page real quick. Looking at this next page, it looks like it's the sleeve of the um, sweatshirt. Is that right? Yeah, so it was just uh, more specific areas that I tested on the sweatshirt. Okay, same, same results though? Yes, all the six stains were the same. Okay. I'm now showing you the, the last page of that exhibit, and it looks like, well, we've had this item of evidence previously identified as a 38 um, special revolver. What did you do with that item of evidence? I examined the item of evidence um, looking for any possible staining on it. I tested three areas on it and they were all negative for blood and I did not do anything else with it. Okay. In this, in this first report, were you also um, asked to analyze um, a sexual assault kit of Sharon uh, Randolph? Yes. And what, what did you find when, well actually, what are the contents of that kit? So there was, that's where her buckle swap kit was. Um, there were cervical swabs, vaginal swabs, rectal swabs, and anal swabs, I'm sorry, oral swabs, and there was also finger swabs. Okay, and with regard to those swabs, what were your findings? So for the cervical, vaginal, rectal, and oral, they were all sperm negative. Um, the finger swabs, I did not test any sort of presumptive testing on it, um, but the, all the profiles I obtained were either full or partial profiles that were consistent with Sharon Randolph. Okay. Um, no foreign profiles or male DNA was detected. Okay, so maybe not surprising, Sharon Randolph's DNA comes from Sharon Randolph. Correct. Okay. Um, that, that was one of the reports that you um, generated in this case. Were you actually asked to do a second report examining different items of evidence? Yes, I was. 
And did those item, items of evidence include um, two Walmart bags and um, a black ski mask? Yes. Okay. The Walmart bags, were they, they plastic, kind of like the bags that we get from the store? Yes, they were. And what, do you remember what area it was of the bag that was uh, tested or analyzed? I did a swabbing of the handles. Okay, so sort of the, like you, well you tell me, what do you do to get the sample? Where, um, you know, where you would carry like a plastic bag from Walmart, um, I would take a damp swabbing of those, that handle area. Okay, and, and it's from there that you um, generate a, a profile? Yes. With regard to, uh, I guess we'll separate the bags. One of the bags um, was impounded under, as item number 17, and one of them was item 18 by the crime scene analyst, right? Yes. You assign different lab numbers for your own tracking. Yes. Um, but we'll stick with the crime scene numbers just for okay. clarity. Um, with regard to item, what was item 17 within the, the crime scene, um, can you tell the members of the jury what your findings were? Yes, um, the DNA profile obtained from the Walmart bag is consistent with a mixture of at least three people. Um, Michael Miller cannot be excluded as the major contributor to the Walmart bag, okay. and the estimated frequency of the major DNA profile in the population is rarer than one in 650 billion. <laughs> identity is assumed. Okay, and can I just stop you there? Yeah. Can you explain that statistic a little bit so the members of the jury would understand what that means? Yes, yeah, so the probability of finding the profile that I found, the major profile on the Walmart bag, the probability of finding that in just randomly in the general population is rarer than one in 650 billion. Um, at the time, the world population was 6.5 billion, and so it was 100 times the world population. Um, and when that happens, and we have a statistic, um, at the time we were doing identity, meaning because the profile of Michael Miller matched that major profile, we were saying identity is assumed. Okay, and I thought I heard you say in these results, um, he was the major profile. That's correct. So um, there's uh, indications of multiple sources of DNA uh, or multiple profiles on that item of evidence? Yeah, there's at least three, probably more. Okay, at least three, probably more people's DNA on that bag. That's correct. Okay, and this would be like touch DNA? That's correct. Okay. I'm assuming. The, the major pro profile, though, um, is identity assumed to Michael Miller? Correct. Okay. With regard to the, the minor profile, um, did you compare that to the other two um, known buckle swabs that you had? Yes. Um, in this case, Thomas Randolph could not be excluded as a minor contributor to the mixture, and greater than 97.4% of individuals in the population are excluded as possible contributors to the mixture. Okay, and 97.4 um, sounds like a, a, a high number, but it, it is nowhere near the, the, what you got in terms of results for the major profile, right? That's correct. Okay. He can't be excluded, but you wouldn't say he's necessarily included either? Um, I wouldn't say 100% that he is on there, but he could not be excluded. Okay. With, um, with regard to the, the second uh, Walmart bag, which is item 18 in our crime scene, um, did you do the same type of testing on the, swab, on the handles, I should say? I did. Okay. And what were your findings there? Uh, the DNA profile obtained from the Walmart bag is consistent with a mixture of at least three individuals. Uh, Michael Miller cannot be excluded as the major contributor to the mixture. Uh, the same uh, statistic, the estimated frequency of the major DNA profile in the population is rarer than one in 650 billion. Identity is assumed. Okay, so the lab would say we're assuming that Michael Miller's DNA is on that second Walmart bag? Is the major contributor, yes. Okay, with regard to um, the profile of Thomas Randolph, were you able to exclude him from that bag? Uh, no, he was not excluded. Um, he could not be excluded as a minor contributor, um, and approximately one in seven individuals in the population could be included as possible contributors to that mixture. So that, that one in seven isn't um, a real discriminating statistic, is that fair? That's correct. Okay, so like if we count up some of our jurors, one in seven could be consistent with some of the results in the uh, mixture, or how would you say it? Statistically, it's possible. Oh. Um, it's definitely not a definitive statistic. It doesn't mean he's definitely there. It just means um, he couldn't be excluded. Okay. Now, the, the, last, um, the last thing is a ski mask. Is that fair? That's correct. Okay. What were your findings with regard to the ski mask? 
Uh, the DNA profile, um, and I'll just say I, I did a swabbing of the inside of it. Okay. Um, and the DNA profile I had obtained from the black ski mask is consistent with a mixture of at least three individuals. Um, Michael Miller cannot be excluded as a possible contributor um, to the mixture. Approximately one in four individuals in the population are included as a possible contributor to the mixture. Now, with the ski mask, um, you said Michael Miller um, can't be excluded. Do you, is it the same, like, identity assumed? I mean, is it that kind of statistic, or how is this one, how would you describe your results on this one? This one was also a mixture of at least three people, um, but there was no major profile. There was no a DNA profile that had more than others, and so I could not pull out a major in this case. And so while he is included, um, it's it's kind of a similarly not great statistic, which is approximately one in four individuals could be included. Okay, and I think you said the mixture, at least at, uh, from your results at the time, appeared to be um, consisting of at least three individuals. That's correct. Could be more. Could be more. Okay, um, but on occasion, um, does sometimes, well, is this unusual for evidence to present at the lab where you just get a lot of a lot of data and a lot of indications of multiple profiles and you just can't separate out a major or a minor? It's, it definitely happens. Okay. I can, you want me to read the last part of the yes. conclusion? Yes. <laughs> Thomas Randolph um, can be excluded as a possible contributor to the mixture. Okay. And did that um, conclude the testing that you did on items of evidence in this case? It did, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll pass the witness, Sean. Good afternoon. Okay, I'm just going to run through these really quickly with you. You tested some gloves, right? Yes. Okay. And you did that because a homicide detective requests that you do that, right? Yes. Isn't that, for the most part, in uh, murder cases, how you uh, get the items and decide to do the testing? In other words, you don't decide to do this testing. You're not out at the scene and don't know the evidence. Is that right? Correct. They would tell us what they would like to have tested, yes. You're a scientist. Yes. When homicide detectives say, hey, test this, test that, that's what you do. Correct. And that's what you did in this case. Is, yes. Do you remember who the test or, or who the requester was? I don't remember, but I can look. Could you please? Would it refresh your memory? Yes, please. Okay. Um, this is the first for the first report. Let's go through the first one. Yeah, yes. so the, with the gloves. Um, looks like Dino Kelly. Okay, and then the second one. Um, Same, Dino Kelly. Okay. Sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so on the gloves, what we what we know is that on these gloves that we have seen, we know that that is has the DNA profile of Michael Miller, correct? Yes, on the on the blood stains that I tested, yes. Okay, and we also know that uh, it was not. You didn't go any farther. You didn't test it against Thomas Randolph, or you did? Um, I got single source profiles that were. The, you know, that were consistent with Michael Miller, so no, I don't think I compared it to Thomas Randolph. Okay. So with regard, um, well, actually, didn't you exclude uh, Mr. Randolph on the gloves? I mean, it's not specifically stated in the report, but on those stains, it was consistent with Michael Miller, so that's okay. where we left it. Okay. Now, with regard to the Walmart bags, there were two of them, right? Yes. And what we know is on both Walmart bags, the handles, we, identity is assumed as to Michael Miller's DNA being on both handles. Yes, as the major contributor. Okay. And then you said that on item 17, 97% of the population could be excluded as a minor contributor, but Mr. Randolph could not. Correct, 97.4. Okay, and then it's the same with item 18, the second Walmart bag. We know it's Michael Miller assumed, right? Yes. And that Mr. Randolph could he could be one in seven in the population can be included as a minor contributor, and he's in that one in seven. Correct. So if somebody said that they had touched those Walmart bags, that could be consistent with leaving your DNA, touch DNA, could Correct. It? Correct. Okay. Then we have that ski mask. Mr. Randolph is excluded, you said. Yes. How many samples did you get from that ski mask? I took one swabbing of the inside of it. That was it? Yeah. Were you ever asked at any point, take another one, or take other, other points around, maybe at the bottom or in the inside, you just did one? 
I took one damp swabbing of the entire inside, yes. And you could not exclude uh, Michael Miller? That's correct. But you could exclude Thomas Randolph? That's correct. Now, only I'm only talking about the mask, the ski mask. Were you ever asked to test DNA of a man or a person named Billy Miller? I was not. That concludes cross examination. Just briefly, um, I think you just said on cross examination that to attempt to get DNA from the ski mask, you took one swab of the entire inside. Yes. Um, did you? Well, why did you do it that way? Um, to determine the wear. Okay. Was okay. what I was aiming for. And if you do the entire inside, did, was it your scientific opinion that that would be the sort of the best bet of, of getting some DNA um, material in order to test? Yes. I mean, rather than the outside or you know the back or something. Yes, like unless that. specifically requested. Sorry. Yes. Um, and on the sort of the face side of the inside, is that where you tested? That's where I focused, but yeah, the inside. Would that be a better source of potential DNA material than the back of a mask? Um, it, it could be yes, because there could be you know sweat and saliva. But you could you know depending on if the person is bald or leaves skin cells, it could be you know anywhere inside. And also because when I received it, they were together, both sides. Oh, they could have rubbed off on each other. Okay, um, but that's where you swabbed um, in, or and then you got the results of at least three individuals. Yes. Thank you. No, you're I don't believe I really looked at that or looked for that. I can't say. If a person was wearing a mask on their face, would you expect to be able to identify a major profile from that item? It would just depend on how many people have worn it before, um, you know, how many people have touched it. It would just depend. If it was the only person who had ever worn it, perhaps. Were you the only forensic analyst on this case? No. Why didn't you do a touch DNA test on the 38 special? I was asked to look for um, blood. Okay. Any follow up based on the jury question? Um, once you swab it for blood, you've kind of collected, or well, when you swab it for blood, that would sort of alter the item of evidence? With the, about the gun? Uh -huh. or? Yes. Um, I mean, I did the testing on it. Um, it would just depend on where the stains were, but I wasn't specifically requested to test for handler. Okay. Was it blood negative? Yes. Thank you. Yes. On the ski mask, you said that the major profile or that Michael Miller was included one in four. Is that right? That was the number. Um, yes. Okay. And you only tested it in one place? Yes, the inside. And it just depends. Sometimes you get DNA, sometimes you don't. That's correct, and sometimes there's multiple people that can contribute to an item. Okay, thank you very much. Say anything else? No, Your Honor. Do you have any follow-up questions in this witness? Okay, seeing no response, ma'am, you are excused. Thank you very much for your testimony here today.
Thank you. Um, the state calls Allison Rubino. My name is Allison Rubino, A-L-L-I-S-O-N-R-U-B-I-N-O. Thank you. Um, how are you employed? I am a forensic scientist in the biology DNA detail at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department Forensic Laboratory. And what um, is your educational background that allows you to work as a forensic scientist? I have a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry from the University of Scranton in Pennsylvania, and I have a Master's of Science in Forensic Science from the University of New Haven in Connecticut. How long have you worked um, in Metro's Forensic Lab? I've been with Metro since January of 2014, so almost 10 years. And during that 10-year period, have you been called upon to testify as an expert in DNA analysis and comparison? Yes. Do you have a ballpark of how many times? I'm going to say close to 75. Okay. Um, we, uh, we've had uh, your colleague, uh, Jen Brown, um, testify before you, so we're, we're not going to go through all the, you know, the explanation of DNA and how it's working in a forensic setting. In this case, um, were you, did you prepare two reports um, with regard to this investigation or this case? Yes, I did. Um, the first one concerned an item of evidence, is that fair? Yes. And can you um, describe for the members of the jury what that item of evidence was? I was <coughs> asked to analyze uh, and conduct analysis on a knife. And, and, I mean, to your knowledge, was that knife found in the crime scene? Uh, as, as far as I know, um, the request was a a knife, it had a wooden handle, and I believed etched on the blade in some part was Pillsbury. Okay, and so you don't actually go out to the crime scene, the, the knife itself is brought to you? Correct. And after it's been impounded by a crime scene analyst? Uh, whether it be a crime scene analyst or an officer on the scene, um, it's impounded and booked by someone other than myself. Okay, um, and did you in fact conduct testing on that item of evidence? Yes, I did. Were you able to um, generate a DNA profile from that uh, knife? Uh, so with regards to this knife, I ended up taking two samples for DNA processing, uh, one from the blade of the handle and one from the um, blade of the knife and one from the handle of the knife. And what were your results? So I did not obtain any DNA from the swab from the blade of the knife, but I did get a DNA profile uh, from the handle of the knife. Uh, and for the handle of the knife, it was a mixture of three contributors, uh, at least one of which was male, and then a comparison was made um, between um, that DNA profile and then the three uh, individual references that were submitted for the case. And the three individual references were Sharon Randolph, Thomas Randolph, and Michael Miller? Correct. Um, were you able to exclude any of the three as being um, a possible source of <coughs> DNA on the knife handle? Uh, Michael Miller was classified as excluded as being a part of that DNA profile. Okay. And what about um, Sharon Randolph or Thomas Randolph? Uh, both Sharon Randolph and Thomas Randolph were classified as being individually included as a part of that DNA profile. So from that knife handle, it indicates to you that there is a mixture, but you said of at least three. Of three, yes. And um, of that three, you cannot exclude Sharon Randolph or Thomas Randolph as being a contributor to that? Uh, correct. They were classified as included. Okay. Now, um, were you, well... 
I think you said that you've been at the lab since 2014? That's correct. From 2014 to 2023, um, has DNA testing become more sensitive? Uh, yes, it has. And are, are scientists like yourself able to um, generate DNA profiles off smaller and smaller amounts of DNA? Uh, yes, a lot of our techniques can get more sensitive <coughs> and enhanced over time, just like uh, any other field that we're working with. If you look at how your cell phones have progressed over the past 10 years and what you've been able to do with that, or, you know, our computers. Um, so just with the evolving technology in a different aspects of our life, in the forensic field, we undergo uh, similar enhancements as our technology uh, increases. Okay, and can you explain to the members of a jury what an extract is? So an extract uh, comes off from part of the DNA process, that initial phase uh, when we're isolating DNA from all of the other stuff within our sample. We're left with a tube of liquid and that liquid is an extract. At the laboratory, uh, we store extracts from cases over time um, for further processing uh, if necessary. And in this case, were you asked to look at extracts from items of evidence that were originally tested by um, Jennifer Brown? Yes, I was. And were they extracts from two Walmart bags and a ski mask? Uh, yes. The first two were swabbings from handles from Walmart bags, and then the third was a, uh, from a swabbing of a ski mask. Okay, so let's talk about um, the Walmart bags. Um, you can talk about whichever one you want first, but what were your findings with regard to those? So in regards uh, to the first Walmart bag, uh, I believe is my lab item five, and then um, Jen Brown's original lab item six, I obtained a mixture of at least five contributors and at least two of which were male. Uh, due to the complexity of this particular DNA profile, no other conclusions could be made with respect to any comparisons. And, and what does that mean? Does it, it just mean there's so much data there that it's uninterpretable or help us understand that? So within our lab, the technologies that we use undergo certain validation procedures to make sure that they are in line and appropriate uh, for our laboratory work. Um, in regards to examining mixture DNA profiles, our interpretation, essentially interpretation threshold stops once we see that a mixture might be of five or more. Uh, they're deemed too complex and therefore we don't make any further conclusions. So essentially, we can't do anything further with that DNA profile. So if, if um, Jennifer Brown um, did her testing and she, um, was un and she couldn't exclude someone as being the source of DNA on that swabbing from the Walmart bag, how do, how do we fit that with your findings? So essentially, there are two independent interpretations. Uh, Jen Brown's was done um, with the technology that, that we had back at the time. She initially looked at those samples. Um, when they were asked to be read, redone to see if uh, our current procedures and protocols uh, could further interpret the mixture DNA profile, the sensitivity of the chemistries that we use uncovered additional information that unfortunately is not suitable for me um, interpreting the profile I obtained from that sample. And, and this was done this year, correct? Correct. And so this was sort of with the, the, the most sensitivity that the lab has at this point? Correct. And um, if I'm understanding you correctly, the way the data presented there, there's nothing else that can be done to interpret it other than saying it's at least five individuals who um, could be contributing to that DNA profile? At least, at least five, correct. Could be more? Could be. Okay. Does that, do, are those results the same um, for both of the Walmart bags? So the second Walmart bag was also a mixture of five contributors. Uh, in this case, I could only say at least one of which was male.
but that again this profile was also uh, too complex to make any further conclusions. Okay. And then um, how about the, the extract from the ski mask? What were your findings there? So for, for that particular sample, I obtained a DNA profile of at least five contributors, and at, at least two of which were male. Uh, unfortunately, due to the complexity, uh, no additional conclusions could be made regarding that DNA profile. Okay. And is it the same thing where nothing more can be done, it's just how the data presents? Correct. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Charles? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You, you don't dispute what Jennifer Brown's findings were, do you? Uh, I can only discuss my findings and interpretations. Jen's are independent on her own from her work. Okay, so basically what I'm asking you is you don't have any, you're not coming in here to say that what she did was inaccurate. You're just saying that you tried to, to get more information with modern, more modern technology. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. The newer DNA techniques come with new statistical criteria, isn't that right? What kind of criteria are you referring to? In order to come up with identity assumed, you have to have different statistics, is that right? Uh, currently we don't use that wording of identity assumed. We use a different statistical calculation for any of the comparisons uh, within our reports. And what is that? We use what's called a likelihood ratio. So when Ms. Brown said identity was assumed, that is something that was used back in 2008, but not today. Correct. In today's more sensitive interpretations, with five or more contributors, you cannot or will not reach an identity assumed finding. Is that what you're saying? Uh, we will never reach an identity assumed because we don't use that wording. Um, but we do all of our work based on validations of our procedures and through the use of our, our technical leader and our technical system, interpreting a profile of at, of at least five contributors was not deemed to be appropriate for the laboratory work that we're conducting. So it was made with those limitations when we took on some of this newer technology to interpret mixtures of two contributors, three contributors, and four contributors. It's not unusual that somebody who would uh, have kitchen knives would have their DNA on the kitchen knife, on the handle. Is that right? Um, I don't talk about how the DNA got there, but I could see how someone's DNA would be on any utensil in their own home. Okay. Ms. Rubino, um, the, the science of DNA, like everything else, is, is evolving? Correct. And the likelihood ratio and the way um, scientists like yourself report out data now is based on the standards in 2023? Uh, correct. And those are standards that are applicable to labs that are accredited? Correct. And um, the LVMPD lab is an accredited lab? Yes. And the, the way it's reported um, with a likelihood ratio, is that a more, um, I guess, conservative way of reporting out data? Uh, it's within our software. Um, it's the statistical calculation that was, um, I guess, embedded into the software when calculating um, if someone could be individually included, excluded, or uninformative. Okay, and so you um, you want to report out your data consistent with the parameters of the software you're using? Correct. Okay, and it's just different um, levels of sensitivity and actually a different way of, uh, the software is different now um, than it was obviously in 2008 and 2009? Correct. Thank you. Any follow-up on that, No, you're right. Do you have any questions for the service? Seeing no response, 
The next witness, Your Honor, is Kimberly Dannenberger. Kimberly Dannenberger, K I M B E R L Y D A N N E N B E R G E R. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes. Um, good afternoon. Hi. Um, you are the third of three DNA analysts to testify um, in, in front of our jury this afternoon, so I'm not going to go through all the uh, explanation of DNA and how it's used in a forensic setting, but could I ask of you what your educational background is? Yes, I have a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in Cell and Molecular Biology. And I also completed an approximate 16 month training program within the Biology DNA section um, where I went over all the functions of my job that I currently do. Okay, and your job is, um, you're a forensic scientist? I am, yes. And um, I, you might have said it and I apologize if I missed it, but how long have you worked at the DNA lab? I have been in the DNA lab um, for approximately 12 years. Um, and I've been doing casework for approximately 11 years. And during that 11 years, have you been called upon to testify as an expert in DNA analysis and comparison? Yes. Um, in this particular case, were you asked to um, look at some evidence that um, was impounded um, by a crime scene analyst? Yes. And do you know who Randy McPhail is? Or do you know who the crime scene analyst is? It, it was Randy McPhail. Okay. And what, what, were the, what were the items of evidence that you were asked to look at? May I refer to my report so I don't misspeak? Would that be okay, Your Honor? Yes. So I was asked to look at um, various items of, ev of, excuse me, of evidence within the same envelope. Um, the first one was a sample of apparent hairs and tissue. The next one was swab of apparent yellow fatty tissue. The third one was swab from the staining on the north hall of the east-west hallway. The fourth one was apparent tissue from the east wall of the north-south hallway. And then the fifth one was swab from staining on the west wall of the north-south hallway above the bathroom door. Okay. And um, you had um, known sample or known profiles to compare your findings to? Yes. There were known profiles within this case. They were previously generated. So I used the data that was previously generated to make comparisons to the evidence that I worked. Okay, and those known profiles were of Sharon Randolph, Thomas Randolph, and Michael Miller? Yes. Okay, so the first item I think that you described looking at was, um, it was a hair and yellow tissue? Yes, okay. the, the, the first one I mentioned was sample of apparent hairs and tissue. Um, that was from the AC vent in the ceiling above the north-south hallway. Okay, now when we're talking about um, hair analysis and DNA, can you tell the members of the jury sort of the, what you're looking for when you're looking for a hair in order to do analysis? So for the type of testing that we do in our laboratory, we need hair that has a possible root attached to it. So if you think of hair, it's a very thin kind of strand. Um, we need something that has kind of a bulbous end on it, kind of a skin tag bulbous root. I do use a microscope to look for this. I'm not just using my naked eye. So under the microscope, I look at items that are potentially hair to determine is it suitable to do the type of testing that we do in our laboratory or is it not suitable? And did you have a suitable sample upon which to um, do an analysis? Yes. And um, that was on like just one hair or how would you describe how you did it? So for this case, I did look at this item of evidence. So again, it was a sample of apparent hairs and tissue. Um, so there were what were described by the crime scene analyst as apparent tissue and hairs. So I looked at it under the microscope to determine were any of the hairs within this sample possibly suitable for what we call um, STR testing or short tandem repeat testing. 
In this case, I did find one hair that was suitable to at least take forward to attempt to generate a DNA profile. The other hairs that were attached within this sample, I determined to be not suitable for testing, so those were not taken forward. So for this item, only one was taken forward um, for hairs. And what were, what were your findings or what were your results with regard to that hair? With regard to the hair? Mm -hmm. um, so I am going to be referencing lab item 11.1, .1, the apparent hair. Um, that was consistent with one female. Sharon, I'm sorry. Let me oh, continue oh, on. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Sharon Randolph was individually included as a contributor to that sample. Thomas Randolph and Michael Miller were both excluded as contributors to that sample. Okay. And did you look, um, well, when you generated um, your report, this was in 2023, is that fair? Correct. My report was this year, yes. Okay. Now, we've had some previous testimony that um, the way um, results were reported out changed from 2008 to 2023. Okay. Is that accurate in your mind? Like how DNA uh, data is reported, like identity assumed versus likelihood ratios? Yes. Our reports have evolved over the years as technology has evolved. So your, um, your results would be reported out in what format? A likely? My, my statistics were a likelihood ratio statistic. Okay. And can you explain to the members of the jury what that is? A likelihood ratio is a statistic. It is the probability of the evidence. So for instance, in the sample I just gave you, that apparent hair, the probability of the profile generated, that, that single source female profile, what's the probability of that profile given two competing scenarios? Um, so scenario one is that the profile came from Sharon Randolph, and scenario two that the profile is some unknown random person that I have not tested. And what were your findings with regard to that ratio analysis? So for lab item 11.1, .1, excuse me, the probability of observing this DNA profile is approximately 2.00 septillion times more likely if it originated from Sharon Randolph than if it originated from an unknown random contributor. And septillion is a number with 24 zeros behind it. Okay, um, really big number, septillion. Compared to a million, yes. Okay, and that was on the apparent hair reported to you as recovered from the AC vent in the ceiling? Yes. Okay, um, did you look at um, another item of evidence which would be your lab item number 12? I did, yes. And what were, well, what did, were you able to generate um, a profile off of that item of evidence? Lab item 12, yes. And wh what was the item of evidence just for context for the jury? So lab item 12 was a swab of apparent yellow fatty tissue from the AC vent in the ceiling above the north-south hallway. And again, that description is from the crime scene analyst. Okay, and um, when you, um, when you, analyze that item of evidence, you were able to get a DNA profile from it and compare it to your known sample or your known profiles? Yes. And what were your findings? So the conclusions for lab item 12, um, number of contributors was one female. Sharon Randolph was individually included as a contributor to that sample. Thomas Randolph and Michael Miller were both excluded as contributors to that sample. Okay. And or was there a similar likelihood ratio that uh, was generated with this, um, this item of evidence? Yes. Okay. What was that? So the probability of observing this DNA profile is approximately 100 million times more likely if it originated from Sharon Randolph than if it originated from an unknown random contributor, and a million is a number with six zeros behind it. Okay. So a, a smaller number. Than, it is, yes. Okay. Um, did you um, attempt or did you look at any other items of evidence um, for this case? Yes. What, what else did you look at? Um, as mentioned earlier, there was, so lab item 11, or excuse me, lab item 13 was a swab from the staining on the north wall, the east-west hallway. Okay. And did you, um, uh, with regard to that, did you do any testing to determine whether or not um, it was, presumptive positive for blood? Lab item 13, I did, yes. And what were your findings? Um, that item, the testing that I performed was negative presumptive blood test. Okay, 
And was there another swab from a wall that you did uh, presumptive blood testing on? Yes, there was. What was that one? That was lab item 15, and that was a swab from the staining on the west wall of the north-south hallway above the bathroom door, and that item was negative presumptive blood test. And so when you got the negative for blood, no further testing was done? Those I actually did take forward through the entire processing oh, okay. um, steps. So what did, you, what did you get with regard to the first one? So for lab item 13, um, it was taken forward to generate a DNA profile. Um, the results for this item are, the DNA profile obtained is consistent with at least one female contributor. Due to the limited nature of this profile, is unsuitable for interpretation. So I was able to generate a DNA profile, but there just was not enough data present for me to make any comparisons or conclusions after that. And the, the one conclusion, though, that you were able to make is that there's at least a female contributor. Correct. Um, but for whatever reason, the um, I guess I should say the sample didn't generate enough data for you to make any further conclusions? That is correct. Okay. Now, with regard to the second wall um, sample, what were your findings there? So for lab item 15, um, that second swab, um, this was taken through all the DNA processing steps. Um, the conclusion for this one was a DNA profile was not obtained. Okay. And what were, what were your findings with regard to, I think, um, lab item 14? So lab item 14 was apparent tissue from the east wall of the north-south hallway. Again, that description comes from the crime scene information. Um, and lab item 14, the conclusions were it was consistent with one female contributor. Sharon Randolph was individually included as a contributor to that profile. Thomas Randolph and Michael Miller were both excluded as contributors to that profile. And this is a swab from the wall? This one for lab item 14 was apparent tissue from the east wall of the north-south hallway. Okay. And um, were you able to generate a likelihood ratio for Sharon Miller versus not? Yes. And what so, was that? So for lab item 14, the statistic, the probability of observing this DNA profile is approximately 36.3 octillion times more likely if it originated from Sharon Randolph than if it originated from an unknown random contributor. And octillion is a number with 27 zeros behind it. So um, it was consistent with Sharon Randolph, um, at, but, but the way you reported out is in that likelihood ratio, and it was octillion that time? Yes. Okay. Um, I think, well, let me just ask this. In all of, all of the um, testing that you did with the, the tissue and the hair where you were able to get results, um, aside from the one where it was just female and you weren't able to do anything else, was all of that um, consistent with Sharon Randolph? Yes, all the profiles where I was able to make comparisons, they were consistent with Sharon Randolph. Okay. And to be fair, the comparisons had different likelihood ratios associated with them. Correct. And in your experience, is that unusual to get a different likelihood ratio on particular items of evidence collected from a crime scene? It is not because the likelihood ratios, again, are dependent on the actual evidence. So in some instances, a full profile may be generated, and in some instances, only a partial profile. So enough data is present for me to make comparisons, make conclusions, but there may not be data at all the locations. Okay. And that's just kind of how the evidence presents. Correct. Thank you. I will pass the witness. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Good, thank you. Just have a few questions for you. The requester for all the analysis you did in this case is whom? Um, based on my report, sorry, um, the requester listed is Dean O'Kelly. Okay. Do you know Dean O'Kelly? I do not. Okay. Um, the date of the work you performed that you just testified to on item numbers 11 through 15 was when? Um, referencing my report, so the dates of laboratory testing, the start date was June 27, 2023, and the end date was July 25th, 2023, and the report was distributed August 1st, 2023. Okay, so just a few weeks ago. Yes. Okay. All right, I want to talk to you specifically about two of the item numbers that you mentioned, specifically 
your lab item number 13. It's referenced in your report as an impound number three. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. It purports to be a swab from the staining on the north wall of the east-west hallway. I'm assuming that particular location on the east-west hallway means nothing to you as an analyst in the lab, right? It does not. That's taken directly from what Crime Scene had on the package. Okay. You receive a package that has a description, yes? Correct. And that's a description that Crime Scene includes on the package? Yes. And on this particular package, your lab number 13, impound item 3, it's a swab, yes? Yes. In other words, in the field, a crime scientist can swab biological material and package it in such a way that you can receive it in the lab and test it? Yes. Okay. And this purports to be a swab from the staining on the north wall of the east-west hallway, right? Yes. You told us that you were um, able to obtain a partial profile, yes? Correct. Of a female, yes? Yes. You also told us that you did a presumptive test, right? Yes. And a presumptive test is one where you're able to do a test to see if it presumes it to be blood. Correct. It's an indication that something possibly could be blood. It's not a confirmation that it is blood. Right. So it presumes it's blood. You have to do further tests, a confirmatory test, to show that it is, in fact, blood. We could, yes. Okay. In this particular case, the presumptive test showed you that that swab in item number 13 wasn't blood, correct? It was negative presumptive test for blood. Okay. I want to talk to you then about item number 15. And that purports to be, again, a swab, yes? Correct, yes. And that's a swab from staining on the west wall of the north-south hallway, correct? Yes. Okay. The jury's heard about the north-south hallway. It doesn't mean anything to you, but it probably means something to them. But that's where that swab is packaged so you know which item we're referring to. Correct. That's the information that, that crime scene had on the package in their report. And as you sit here today, you would agree with me that when you did a presumptive test, it was presumptive negative for blood. That is correct, yes. And from that particular swab from the north-south hallway, you aren't able to obtain anybody's DNA at all, right? Correct. The conclusions for that were a DNA profile was not obtained. So as you sit here today, would you agree with me that you can't tell us whose DNA that was? Correct. There was nothing that was even, excuse me, the profile that was generated, if there was anything there, it was not above our threshold, so I could not make any conclusions. It was no DNA profile obtained. And you can't even tell us it's blood, right? Correct. Okay. Can you tell us who took the swab? Um, it was impounded by crime scene analyst uh, with personal number 3326, who was Randy McPhail. Okay. Um, did you test any swabs impounded by either a crime scene analyst, Jeff Smith, or a crime scene analyst, Chelsea Collins? I did not, no. Nothing further. Any follow-up? No, Your Honor, thank you. our afternoon recess. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including fellow jurors, in any way regarding the case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, the internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not read, watch, or listen to any news or media accounts or commentary on the case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using the record materials. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate any aspect of the case, or in any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. You must not form or press any opinion regarding this case or its finance and energy. Ladies and gentlemen, it's 2.45. We'll be in recess till 3 o'clock. All rise for the jury.
jury's all present and accounted for. Okay, we are back on the record. C two five zero nine six six. David Bond versus Thomas Randolph. Here's the record book that Mr. Randolph is present with his attorney, Devin Dishburn, on behalf of the state. Do both parties stipulate to the presence of our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Stay the next witness. The next witness, Your Honor, is Lita Miller. Vida Miller, V I D A Miller, M I L L E R. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mrs. Miller. Hi. How are you? I'm blessed and highly favored. Okay. Thanks. Um, did you uh, know someone by the name of Michael Miller? Yes, ma'am. What uh, were you were you related to him? Uh, auntie by marriage. Okay, so he's on your husband's side of the family. Yes. And is your husband Mr. Billy Miller? Yes, ma'am. Um, did Michael Miller ever come to live at your house? Yes. Do you remember approximately when that was? Uh, Christmas Eve. Of two thousand seven. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, he just came because he was um, like a family member and you let him stay there? Yes. When he was staying at your house, um, did he have his own room? Yes, ma'am. And did he kind of come and go as he pleased because yes, he was yes. a man? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I'm sorry, your voice is a little quiet. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just if you can pull it towards you, it might be easier. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, at, at that time, did, your, did you and your husband um, own a business? Yes, ma'am. What, what, was, what was the nature of the business? Uh, commercial um, cleaning, Did office cleaning. Office cleaning? Yes, ma'am. So you would go into offices at night and yes, do the service? Yes, ma'am. Did um, you ever, did yourself or your husband ever bring Michael Miller along to help with the work? Yes, ma'am. Um, sometime after Michael arrived and was staying with you, did you meet an individual by the name of Thomas Randolph? Yes, ma'am. And um, who introduced you to him? Michael. Michael Miller? Michael Miller. Okay. Where was it that that happened? At our home uh, in our garage. Okay. So uh, Mr. Randolph had come to your house and um, Michael introduced him to you? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you remember how long after Michael arrived that you met Mr. Randolph? Not exactly. Um, and that's that's fine. This is a while ago. Do you yes, would it have been like weeks or months or do you have any sense of that? Mm, maybe weeks. Weeks. Okay. So shortly after that. Yes. Um, do you see Mr. Randolph in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Um, could you describe what he's wearing today, please? A light blue shirt. Yeah, uh, blonde hair. May the uh, record reflect that she has identified the defendant, Your Honor? Okay. You, you uh, never became friends with Mr. Randolph, is that fair? No, ma'am. Did, um, did you see Mike interact with Mr. Randolph? Um, just sitting at the mailbox uh, for hours. Um, and when you say sitting at the mailbox for hours, um, you weren't at the mailbox, right? No, ma'am. My uh, bathroom window faced the mailbox, my front door faced the mailbox, and my den faced the mailbox, okay. the window. So you were looking out a window? Yes, yes, ma'am. And you could see the mailbox? Yes, ma'am. And what did, what did you, where were uh, Michael Miller and Mr. Randolph? Sitting in a car. Sitting in a car? Yes. Did, did you know whose car it was? It was Mr. Randolph's car. Michael didn't have one. Okay. And it appeared they were both sitting in the car? Uh, yes, ma'am. I made 
sure because I stopped one day and, and offered Mike something to eat. They sit out there so long, I offered him chips. He got out the car and came and got him. Okay. Went and got back in his car. So it was so long that you went up and offered Michael some food? Yes. Um, at, during the time period that Michael was staying with you, did he have a cell phone? When he first arrived, he had a cell phone. Was there a point where his cell phone um, no longer worked or he wasn't using it anymore? Correct, yes. And then um, how would he get phone messages? On our home phone, uh, business phone, yes, sir. You have a, or at that time you had a, um, a home phone that also was used for your business? Yes, ma'am. Um, so was that a phone messaging system that you kept track of because you needed to run your business? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall if Mr. Randolph ever left messages for your nephew, Michael Miller, on that um, on that line? Yes, ma'am, he did. Any idea of how many? It was many. Like many, like 10 or many, many more? Many, many, many. Hundreds? Yes. 200? About 200. Okay. And were you the person kind of sifting through those messages? Uh, yes, ma'am, was the only one that went through those messages. Okay. Um, did you think that the relationship um, between Mr. Randolph and your nephew um, was odd? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever offer to um, Michael to hear or listen to those messages? Yes, ma'am. And did he, um, did he want to hear them? No, ma'am, he didn't. When was it approximately that you made that offer? Oh, well, I would always let him know he had messages, but he didn't care to listen to them. Okay. Um, do you recall um, if Mr. Randolph ever left Michael a message about a gun? Yes, he did. What was the nature of the message? He went, told, me, told me, he said for Michael need to bring his gun back home. Okay. Back to him. And... Were you aware of whether or not Michael heard that message? I know he didn't hear that message. Okay. Do you know if Michael ever took steps to return a gun? I know that my husband told him he had to take it back out of... Where I had to take it out of our house. Okay. Let, I'll, I'll rephrase. Okay. Okay. Did, um, did you ever... Not what they said, but did you ever see Michael or your husband... Uh, leave the house after that message? I saw in. Michael. Michael leave? Yes. Okay, and was that with a gun? Yes. Was there any further messages about from Mr. Randolph saying he was still I missing, have, missing the gun? gun? No. Okay. Um, when Mike was staying with you, um, did, did he have a lot of money or a lot of clothes, anything like that? No. Um, was he kind of struggling and trying to get on his feet? Yes, ma'am. Did Mike have a car? No, ma'am. Other than um, Mr. Randolph, did you ever see any other person give Mike a ride? Just myself. I would let him use my vehicle. Uh, okay. So you, you would let him borrow your car? Yes, ma'am. Um, but did you ever see him have any friends come over and pick him up or anything like that? No, ma'am. Do you... Um, did, well, let me ask this. Did he have another way of traveling or getting around? The bus. Do, how about a bike? Uh, I don't know if my husband let him use the bike or not. Okay. I don't follow him out the door. Sure. Um, but to your knowledge, his options were kind of limited if you didn't, you or your husband didn't let him use a car? Yeah, I just thought it was always the bus. Okay. Um, towards the, the end of Mike's life, did he um, indicate to you that he thought he was going to come into some money? Yeah, he told me that he had met a young lady and they were going to move away together and he was getting some money. He was coming into some money. Okay. Any further conversation about that? No. Thank you very much, ma'am. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Hi. 
It's been a long time since this uh, incident, right? Yes, yes, sir. You were first talked to by detectives the day after uh, Michael was was killed. Yes, sir. Okay, on the 9th, right? Right, that same day. Yes, sir. Okay, pretty much. It, it, you know, it's... It was late hours, so it was within a 24-hour period the, the police came and talked to you, right? It was early in the morning. We just got in from cleaning the buildings. Okay. And have you ever reviewed your voluntary statement you gave to uh, Detective Mogg? Uh, yes. There was somebody else there besides police when the actual interview was happening. Your, your husband, Billy, was actually there, right? Yes, sir. In fact, if you, in the voluntary statement, you answer some questions, Billy answers some questions, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So you were in your house. Is that where the interview was taking place? At the kitchen table. Okay. And you would agree with me that your memory was probably better uh, at that time uh, regarding the incident and right before that. Would you agree yes, with me? Yes, sir. Do you remember being asked about a ski mask? Mm. I remember uh, talk about a ski mask, but I wasn't. Uh, yeah, I kind of remember talk okay. about a ski mask. And, and maybe I let's just say it this way: Were you did the detectives ask about a mask? Do you remember to having a discussion about a mask with the detectives? Um, ask about a mask, but I've never seen a mask. Do you remember telling the detectives that you were aware of a ski mask in the house, but it had been missing since December of 2007? Do you remember Not telling? I. It wasn't me. Okay. If I showed you a copy of the transcript, Okay. Would that refresh your memory? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Counsel, I am showing the voluntary statement, May 9th, 2008. I'm going to be referring to page 15 and 16. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Ms. Miller, I'm just going to ask you, you can take that. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to ask you if you wouldn't mind just reading from where my pen is on page 15 and then read down there. And before we get started, do you see how the initials say BM? Do you see that where it says BM? Yeah, is that Billy Miller? Right. And then you see there's VM. And yes. V is in Victor, right? Or is in this case V. Correct. Right? Okay. So if you could just sort of read to yourself all the way down page 15 and then turn the page and read half of 16, please. Let me know when you're done. Take your time. Read this whole page? No. I'm sorry. From I should here, be more clear. From this one? From this BM? Or? Yes, if you want to. If you want to read the whole page just so so that uh, I don't have you don't have your glasses, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Would it, um, let, let me see if, because you don't have your glasses, if we can do, go through this another way, okay? And the prosecution's looking at the statements as well, okay? Okay, so you see the detectives are asking on page 14 about a mask. Excuse me, it's 15, right? Ms. Weckerly, I, I am just so that she has oh, the, the context, the context sure. on the very bottom of page 14. The detectives say, what about a ski mask, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, and the prosecution can see that. I'm going to leave the rest of it out because they just go on about a description about holes in the eyes and stuff like that, okay? okay. And now I don't want to hear what Billy has to say. Billy has some things and we're going to hear from him, okay? But they ask... Mrs. Miller, are you familiar with that ski mask? Okay, and I, I want to make sure I'm reading this right. You say, yes, I am. I remember it. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, is that a yes? That's a yes. Okay, and then the police say, and when was the last time you think you might have seen it? And you say, mm, probably before Christmas, 2007. Do you see that? I said the whole 2007? Okay. Just okay. So no, I, I'm just quoting you. I think these are your words. You say, um, probably before Christmas 2007. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. Okay. So let's turn the page, okay? 
The police then say, after we're finished with our interview, would it be possible for you to look and see if you can find it? Okay? And you answer, yes. Do you see that? Yes. And then they ask, have you looked around for it since then? And VM, that's you, you say, I've cleaned areas where it would normally be and I haven't seen it. Okay? Okay. okay. And, and Ms. Weckerly will make sure that I'm reading that accurately. Okay. So does that refresh your memory as to you actually saying, yes, I was aware of a ski mask, I just haven't seen it since uh, December of 2007. Probably before Christmas 2007. Correct. Okay, if yes. that's what the court says. I mean, that's what the record says. Okay, and I understand. Don't remember. <laughs> I understand it's been a long time, okay? But you wouldn't dispute the transcript, right, if that's what right. it says? Okay. And at the end of the interview, do you remember you tell the police, you know, if you want to, you can go ahead and search the house for that? Do you remember that? No. You don't remember that? Do you remember I don't remember that either, but... Do you remember the police searching the house for a mask, or no? No, they didn't. They didn't? They did not. Okay. What did this mask look like? I don't remember. Ms. Weckerly, the prosecutor, this lady, asked you about transportation for Michael. Do you remember that? And you said yes. that. Okay. And one thing is, sometimes in court, they have to take everything down. So I'll make sure that I let you finish your answer, and I'll, if you can let me finish my question, okay? Okay. Uh, do you remember, she asked you about transportation for Michael. Do you remember that? Yes. And specifically, one of the questions was, did Michael have a bike? Do you remember that? He didn't have a bike. Okay. But yes, I remember the question. <laughs> Do you recall saying previously under oath that Michael had a bike that he would ride around on? His, that his mode of transportation was a bicycle. Do you remember saying that? During the first... Uh, No, not really. If I showed you a copy of what you said, do you think that would refresh your memory? If it's in there, I believe it. Okay, I'm just going to show it to you if that's okay. okay. We'll go through it, okay? I understand it's been a long time, okay? And so it's very, something. very long time. Yeah. For a 70 year old woman. Okay, so I, remember. I am showing her from this transcript and page 44. May I approach you? Yes. Ms. Miller. I understand you don't have your glasses, so if you, uh, what I'll do is I'll just try to read the question, and, and, and again, Ms. Weckerly will make sure that I'm, I'm reading this correctly. Okay. okay. He, you're being asked, did he have a mode of transportation, and you say bicycle, and sometimes my vehicle, if he was trying to get a job. Okay? Okay. Okay? Okay. So does that refresh your memory as to Michael having a bicycle? Yes. It was our bicycles. But oh, yes. okay. So it was your bicycle and he would use <laughs> okay. it. Okay. Yes, our bicycles. Fair enough. So, uh, fair to say that Michael would either ride the bicycle that's associated with you and uh, your husband. Yes. Right? Yes. Sir. Or sometimes he would borrow your car, right? Yes, sir. He'd also had a, a, a girlfriend. He'd just gotten a girlfriend uh, shortly before his death. Isn't that right? That's what he told me. And she would give him rides, wouldn't she? I don't know. You're not sure? I don't know. Did you ever meet the girlfriend? No. You remember saying that Mr. Randolph had only been at the house twice, ever. Do you remember saying that? Uh, okay. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Could you specify when she said 
Yes. Um, do you recall previously in uh, 2008 saying that, under oath, saying that he had been at the house, Mr. Randolph, on two occasions? Uh, that means that he was sitting at the mailbox because I only saw him at the and I only saw him there in the garage once. Okay, so if I understand you, you saw him once at the at the mailbox, and another time he was at the house for a total of two times. I saw him twice at the mailbox. If I didn't put that in there. Okay. So, how many times did you see Mr. Randolph? at the house or the mailbox near that area? How many? Before the murder, uh, three times. Three times? Okay. Yes. You believe that Mike was a doing day work uh, for Mr. Randolph, is that right? Yes, sir. And you also talked today about a voicemail left by Mr. Randolph where he seemed upset and was instructing Mike to bring a gun back, right? Right. Are you saying that you think there were a couple of hundred voicemails from Mr. Randolph that you deleted? Oh, it was many, many. Hundreds? Voice mails. It was many. And I, I don't mean to nitpick. I, I really don't want to. But could you give us, are we talking tens? Are we talking hundreds? Are we? <laughs> you know, uh, it's been so long ago, but it was tons. I know that much. And I turned it all over to the DA years ago. Okay. Do advantage. They should have had a record of all those emails and not for me to, I mean, voicemails and not for me to try to remember those numbers of voicemails that came in. But it was tons. That's all I can say. It was a lot. And every day there was emails. I mean, voicemails. Miss Miller, that's fair enough. Okay. Thanks. I understand. You're saying that they should they should be able to say, and it's, it's a long time ago, you shouldn't have to recall that, right? Right. You said that Mike had a cell phone when he first arrived in December 2007, right? Right. How many cell phones did you see in Mike's room? In his room? Yeah. I only see Mike with, I guess, one, one uh, on, his, on his personal, not in his room. Were you also missing a pair of gloves? I don't know. I kind of remember some about some gloves. Now, if I understand you correctly, you said that Mike said that he was coming into some money and he was going to go with his new girlfriend and they were going to move to Florida or California. Remember that? Yes. Yes, I do. And Mike also told you that he was going to have nothing more to do with Mr. Randolph, right? Right. So just so I understand that, Mike's saying, I'm not going to have anything more to do with this man over here, right? Right. And I'm going to come into some money. I'm going to move with my girlfriend to Florida or California, right? Right. That concludes cross-examination. Mrs. Um, Miller, I just have a couple questions for you, if that's okay. Um, when um, Mike told you that he was going to have nothing else to do with uh, Mr. Randolph, um, how, when was that in relation to the murder? That was when I told him he received a phone call from Randolph saying that, um, don't tell us what Mr. Randolph said. Well, yes, if we could just get a foundation, she's asking for a date, Your Honor. 
Well, he received a phone call from Mr. Randolph, and Mr. Randolph was very upset, and he was fussing in the phone about, you know, I don't know how he can have a girlfriend when he can't afford cigarettes, and how could he, do, uh, you know, it was, it was. Then after that phone call, I uh, talked to Mike, and Mike said, well, I'm not having anything else to do with him. And and I appreciate that, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear with my question, but was that like a week before the murder, or a day, or three days, or? No, a week before. A week before? Okay. And the, um, I know this was a long time ago, um, when you talked about the voicemails, you said there were hundreds of them? Yes. Um, do you, do you remember testifying that you actually had deleted them before? Before, um, I had just really just deleted them all, but I had a record of Vonage. C certainly there's phone records, but yes. the, the actual content of the voicemails, you had no way of knowing what was going to happen, but you you deleted them before the detectives got there? After he said he wouldn't have anything else to do with Randolph, I just deleted okay. all the voicemails. And you mentioned that um, you saw Mr. or Mr. Randolph was at your house two times, and you described the mailbox time. Yes. Where you bring Mike some chips. Yes. Were there other times where you would see Mr. Randolph, like not come to the house, but pick Mike up? I can't remember. Okay. Um, when the detectives um, interviewed you. I think you said like that you sat down at your kitchen table, yourself, your husband, and the detectives? Yes. Sir. Okay. Do you recall if after that interview, um, the detectives asked you and your husband for consent to search just Mike's room? I don't remember. Okay. I, I was, after they told me what happened to Mike, I almost fainted. I couldn't I you almost fainted. remember anything. Yeah. Um, is it, um, you just have, do you have any recollection of whether they, uh, them searching Mike's room or anything like I that? I don't remember that. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Okay.
Did you ever have any valuable items go missing or disappear while Mike Miller was living with you? No, never. You previously said that you had seen Mr. Randolph at your house three times. Did Yes or no, did Mr. Randolph ever come to your house after Mike's death? No. Okay. State any follow-up based on the jury questions? No, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Long? No, Your Honor. Okay. Ma'am, you are excused. Thank you very much for your testimony here today. State, you may call your next witness. State will call Billy Miller to stand. Okay. Billy Miller, the I L A Y, M I L A R. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, um, sir. In probably around Christmas time of 2007, were you living here in Las Vegas? Yes. And who were you living here with? My wife, Vita. All right. How long have you lived here in Las Vegas? Since '77. Around that time, uh, did a did a nephew come to visit? Yes. And what was his name? Michael Miller. All right. Where was Mike from originally? Rock Hill, my Rock home. Rock Hill, South Carolina. Rock Hill, South Carolina. Okay. Do you recall why Mike came out here? What was he looking to do? Well, he knew I was here, and he was just looking for a fresh start because everybody came, always sought me or my other brother out. Okay, so you had other family members come out from Rock Hills? Yes. And, and so he was coming out too? Yes. At the time, did he have a settled job here in Las Vegas? No. Uh, as far as you know, did he have any, you know, stable income or anything of that nature? No, we did not. Okay, so no job and no money? No money. Was the plan once arriving to Las Vegas to start looking around for work? Yes, he did. When, around that time, did you have a business yourself? Yes, janitorial was, business. What is, I'm sorry? A janitorial business. A janitorial, was it for commercial businesses? Commercial. Um, while he was trying to get on his feet, did you even offer to have him assist you and your wife with that business? He did. About how old was Mike back in late 2007, early 2008? Uh, he was 30, 39. About how big was he? My size. Okay. He's about 5'5", five, five, okay. about 145. Okay. At some point in 2008, do you meet someone by the name of Thomas Randolph? Yes, I did. Who was the person who introduced you to Mr. Randolph? Michael, my nephew. Where was the first person you saw? Where was the first place that you saw Mr. Randolph? Well, my mailbox is where the visitors park also, right in front of my door. It's a condo. Okay. That's where I saw him, who and he waved me over. And you said they waved me over? Yes. Okay, meaning who, when you say they, who are we talking Michael, about? Michael, my nephew. And? He introduced me to who he called Tom. All right. Now, do you see Tom here in the courtroom today? I do. Could you please point out where he is in the courtroom and maybe uh, describe an article of clothing that he's wearing? Blue shirt. Uh, tie or no tie? No tie. All right, let the record reflect the witnesses identify the defendant. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a time that you recall Tom coming inside your house? No. Okay, how about your garage? Yes, to the entry to my garage. Okay, tell me about that. What do you remember about that? My daughter and her boyfriend were visiting, and we were sitting down at the bar <clears throat> to my kitchen area, just talking. And uh, my daughter came up and says, um, Mike says, um, Tom want to see your cars. All right, what sort of cars did you own at that time? 69 Roadrunner and a 91 Push. Okay. Um, so, what did you do at that point? I gave him a funny look when I got down to the garage, like, um, I never introduced you to my cars. 
So you were kind of private about I it. was private about my cars and also the fact that Mike was not a car guy, in my opinion, when we spoke. I felt like it was uh, kind of like a an odd situation for me to be in. All right. So do you stay down there very long? Not long, because the conversation was quick. Okay. Um, back then, how tall, think, if you can remember, what was Tom? He's probably six two, three. All right. How big was Tom? He was the uh, size of a fella. Okay. I maybe mean, 200, what? maybe 240, give or take. Okay, so somewhere between 200 and 240. Right, right. Okay. As the days and weeks go by, do you notice Tom um, somewhere in the general area of your condo? Yes. Where would you typically see Tom? In front of the mailboxes. Who um, would he be with? Mike. And where would they be? They'd be in the car talking. All right. Were the windows up or down? They were up. How long would you, if, if you would come by and, and notice them there, how long would they stay inside the car? Hours. Hours. Do you recall them working on any projects outside by the mailbox? No. Any, like, you know, home improvement things by the mailbox? No. no. I want to ask you a little bit about Mike's, um, well, let me do this. Um, were there times, well, let's do, we're going to stop for a second. Uh, when Mike shows up, uh, does he have any clear mode of transportation when he first kind of moves in and lives with you? No, I had to pick him up. All right. On the bus stop. Does he start to use something that belongs to you to kind of get around? Yes, my wife had a little small um, SUV. Okay. And so, while he was looking for work, okay, she allowed so him to use her car. From time to time. Did yes. he ever use a bike? I had bikes in my garage. Okay. But I he never actually used one of my bikes. Okay. So you remember um, you remember speaking to the police probably about a day after Mike passed away, is that right? Yes, several days after he passed away. Okay. I know it's been a really long time. Would it help refresh your recollection if maybe you had a chance to just look at a page to see whether or not you recall Mike ever using one of your bikes? Sure. And page page thirteen, counsel. All right. Does that help refresh your recollection? Does that help refresh your memory? Yes. Okay, so at least now, I mean, I know it's been a long time. Um, does that help refresh your memory? Did, did he ever use a bike of yours from time to time? Uh, my wife's bike, yes. Okay. Were there times that you observed Tom picking up Mike with his car? Yes. How often would that happen? At least several times a week, for sure. Did it include, so it included pickups, is that yes, right? Pick Did it ever include drop-offs? Yes, pickup and drop-offs. I want to ask you about uh, the phone situation. When Mike first showed up around Christmas, did he have a cell phone? He did. At some point, does he lose it or he doesn't have kind of a working cell phone? That's what it was. It just wasn't working. So is there a phone <coughs> line that you provide Mike to use? Yes. Which line is it? It was called Vonage. Okay, so that's the carrier that you used it? Right. Was it a business line? It was a business line. Um, and did you provide that phone number to the police? We did. Okay. Was, was that number 702-987-3269? 987, yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, do you remember as you kind of would, I don't know, so where was that phone line located? It was in the kitchen. All right. Um, so when you'd be home, once Mike had met, well, let's do it this way. Mm -hmm. Before Tom meets Mike, I want to focus on that phone line for a mm -hmm. second. How often did that thing ring? Before Mike, before Tom? Infrequently. Okay. All right. Let's switch it up. Mm -hmm. When Mike and Tom kind of start hanging out, uh, how often does that phone ring? It rang if he wasn't there. It would ring, um, if Tom wasn't there, it would ring regularly for Mike. Okay. Uh, do you recall, also recall uh, Michael having conversations on that, that specific phone? Yes. 
Do you also recall whether or not it had a voicemail system? It did have a voicemail system. Did it get loaded up with voicemails? Overloaded. Okay. Did you guys ultimately kind of delete those messages? My wife did because it was overloaded. <clears throat> Given the interactions between, and oh, let me ask you this. Back in the day, I mean, how much older did Tom seem compared to Mike? Like grandfather, elderly. elderly. Comparatively. Compared to Mike, right. When you just observed kind of this, and your understanding is what? That he was kind of doing odd jobs for this guy? That's what he told me. He said... Um, Okay, I'm going to talk about Mike would tell me that um, Tom was going to help him um, get some part-time work that he had, like a handyman type work. Okay. And, and, and as far as you know from, from, from your nephew, did he have a prior career as a handyman as far as you knew? No. So when you see the number of times this guy shows up, when you see the conversations for hours outside the mailbox when you hear the phone ringing what was your thought about this relationship between these two I couldn't think too much of it because Mike said that Tom liked him okay. and was trying to help him get work so and you didn't that want to read too much into I it. didn't want to read too much into it because I know he needed work okay but putting that aside mm -hmm. did you think it was strange Judge, objection, that's leading. We asked the question and we didn't like the answer, so we did it. We just said, we asked a leading question then. So, okay, so based off of this, I understand you said, look, you were trying to be positive because Mike was looking for work. Yes. But when you saw the conversations, the sitting in the car, the phone call ring, did you think it seemed a little strange? It was strange because he was not getting work. Okay. Okay. Do you recall Mike complaining to you about not getting enough work from Tom? Absolutely. And yet they continued to hang out. Yes. And he continued to call. Yes. But not enough money was there. He wasn't able to do the jobs because he wasn't able to uh, assist him because his back was hurt and he couldn't get out of bed sometimes. That was a complaint. Okay. So you'd have Mike would go over mm -hmm. and then they weren't even doing any work. Came back with no money and upset. Do you recall at some point learning that, that Mike went out shooting with Tom? He told me that Tom wanted to take him shooting at the shooting range. Okay. And asked, how did I feel about that? I said, well, when my wife uh, came out and the kids, I took them shooting. That's the first thing we did, went to a shooting range so they can get familiar with the guns that I had. Okay. So, so you remember him being invited to go shooting? Several times that never materialized because he was unable to go. Okay, meaning Tom? Tom's back was hurting, so he couldn't go. Okay, so as far as you know, from sometimes you heard about it, Tom wasn't able to go some right. of the times. But Tom did invite him as far as you he know. He did invite him. Okay. Um, is there a time where you observed Mike in possession of a gun? It was strange because it was a handgun. Right. And... He showed it to me, and I said, you, you brought a gun home to the house, and he's going to take you shooting. So when is he going to take you shooting? He says, well, you know, Tom, he, sometimes his back hurts. And I left it at that. And when I walked my dog, maybe 30 minutes later, going past the pool, 
he catches up with me. Mike catches up with me, and he says, I can't believe he wanted me to bring the gun back right away. I said, what do you mean? He's blowing my phone. He's blowing the phone up. Bring the gun back. So you, so you, did you tell him also to bring it back? I told him you got to take it back. Get it to him. Tell him to come back and pick you up because I'm not going to take you. Okay. Did, did he tell you whether or not Tom gave him the gun or anything about that? He said Tom wanted him to get familiar with the gun. Okay. I want to turn your attention to around May of 2000, or very early May, because I know, I know Mike passes away on May 8th, but early May. Do you remember there being a discussion about Michael house-sitting with you about Michael house sitting for Tom. Yes, he did. He came to me and he says, Unc, he says, um, I don't know how I feel about this. I said, what do you mean? He says, Tom wanted me to house sit for him and Sharon. And this is just timeline wise. This is one week before he passes away. Yes. So Tom's going to be out of town and Mike is supposed to be inside that house. House sitting. Okay. Do you give him some advice? I did. What's the advice you I gave? I told him that. You're new to the neighborhood and probably to some neighbors, and you being um, a young black man in this man's house, any neighbor could walk up and say, "Who are you? What are you doing here?" And you can't have anything except to say, "Well, I'm Tom." And I say, "So you get him to give you a certified letter, stated that you are house sitting for him okay. at this address." In that week, um, in that week leading up to his passing um is is mike inside the house a lot is he house sitting or it, maybe you know or you don't know i don't I, know i don't know okay i don't know after the house sitting maybe a couple of days before um he passes away or maybe a little bit about a week before he passes away does um does mike have a conversation with you where he tells you some of his future plans that he's about to do Yes. Okay. So let me let me just ask you a few questions and you okay. just okay. answer them. All right. So, um, does Mike tell you that he's planning on leaving the state of Nevada? Yes, he does. Okay. Does he tell you that he is going to be coming into some money that he's getting from Tom? He did. Did he tell you that the plan was is that Tom was going to hire him as a driver because Tom had a bad back? Right. Did he tell you that he was going to start this new life with a, a girlfriend that he made, or that he that he had met, and they were going to be moving out of state? Yes, he had, and then he wanted to go visit his son because his, another young lady um, knew he was out here, okay. and he was going to visit her also. Okay, and then he, did he also tell you that with that money he was going to get from Tom, that he and Tom... We're going to go buy jet skis together with some. I know money. he did. It, it kept squishing up, so I, you know it wasn't a few days. It was from one story to the next, and I'm thinking he's just kind of just just, just if you. I'm sorry. So, Billy, yeah, Billy, Billy, you can just answer yes or no. Okay, so I'm yes sorry. No. Did Mike tell you that he and Tom, with that money that they were coming into, were going to use some of that money to buy jet skis? Yes, he did. Okay, so. Um, He's your nephew, right? Yes. I would assume you knew him for 39 years? Yes. Okay. In the 39 years, had you ever heard or seen Mike go jet skiing? No. Okay. Was Mike a boatman? No. Okay. Let me do this. Do you remember back when you were interviewed by the police a day after about whether or not you had a ski mask inside of your house. Do you I, remember that? I did. Okay. recognize this as something from your house? No, it's not. Okay. Um, do you remember, um, well, well, let me ask you this. Okay. 
what is it about it to you that looked different? What, why is, does this not look like something that came out of your home? Because mine had, uh, it wasn't tied don't together. It, don't say it wasn't it. tied together there. It was more like um, open like this. Oh, and so you could see all You could see all the way around. And also the mouth <clears throat> was, um, it, would, it would cover your mouth, but you could, you could uh, breeze through it as if you were riding a bike. You could have you know, a lot of breezing. Okay, so there's more room absolutely for your nose and your mouth, right? Exactly. And there's room for your eyes. Yes. And just I'm going to publish this to the, mm -hmm. to the jury. So those eye holes of this, the ski mask in your house are a lot wider, and there's a lot more room for your uh, mouth and your nose to breathe. Yes. Okay, so. So you recall maybe a day after this happening with Mike, you being interviewed and saying, you know, we had a ski mask that went missing, but when you took a look at this, that's not the That case. was not it. Okay. No. And, and do you remember giving police permission, like, hey, you can come look in a portion of the house, see if you can find it? Yes. Okay. But looking at that, that ain't, that that ain't was, the one. That was not it. Okay. Um, one other question. Um, let me ask you about baseball for a second. Michael ever wear anything on his head? Baseball cap, um, pull close, you know, like you pull the bib down real close. Okay. That's what he wore. I want to take what's been published as states 303B. You recognize this? Yeah, that's just. That's what he wore all the time. And by he, you mean My who? Michael, my, my nephew. So yes. Michael was wearing this all the time? Yeah. Did you say he wore it religiously? He did. Okay. Even up until his death. I guess I'll publish the jury as well. Sorry, our counsel pointed something out. When you head on, we actually can't pick that up. Okay, yes, that's what he wore all the time. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have no further questions for this witness. Good afternoon. You were asked about a bike. Mike would borrow a bike, is that right? Yes. He would use it to get around. My wife's bike, but he didn't use it that often. He would. My wife uh, made every effort to help Mike get a job, so her car, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so he would use the small SUV that your wife owned sometimes? Yes. Okay. And he also had a girlfriend, didn't he? Right towards the end of his life, he had a little girlfriend, right? I found out that he did have a girlfriend at the end, okay. according to my wife. Did you ever learn that he r received dry, uh, rides from her? She would drop him off when I heard sometimes. Okay. You told the police that Mike had actually cleaned out Mr. Randolph's garage as part of this, you know, handyman type thing. Do you remember saying that? He said he would have odd jobs sometimes. Okay. And um, whatever it was for his wife or her, her child, one of her daughters. Okay. That's what he said he was going to do. Okay. So if I heard you correctly, Mike said he was doing are supposedly going to do odd jobs for Mr. Randolph. Mm -hmm. Mr. Randolph, right? Right. And his wife, Sharon, mm -hmm. right? Just for the record, is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Just so it's taken down. Okay. Sure, I got that. All right. And also you said for the daughter. Do you remember saying that? He said that he was going to do some work for his, her, her daughter. For Sharon's daughter. For Sharon's daughter. Oh. Right. He said he was going to house it for in the month of May. Mike said he was going to house it for Tom. For Tom and Sharon. Okay. 
Sometimes Mike would want advances of money from Mr. Randolph, wouldn't he? I have no idea because he never got paid when he did the work. Okay. That's what it was complaint. Were there gloves that went missing from your house? Not to my knowledge. Do you remember telling a Detective O'Kelly or any police officers that some gloves had gone missing from your house? Show me where I said that, please. If you can. Actually, it's in a... Press my memory. I can. Okay. Please. Yeah, I think the problem is going to be it's coming from a police report and not the state. Okay, so you're going to object to the hearsay? Can we defer? Sure. Yeah. Do you remember telling detectives, this is page 20 of the 68 page officer's report, telling detectives that you were missing a pair of black cotton gloves? What kind of gloves were they? Black cotton gloves. As I said again, um, I don't, if I said it for, for in 08, for, for the, how long ago but it was? That's a long time. I have... <clears throat> I have gloves that I wear for work because I do janitorial work. And um, I can't say a, a pair of gloves were missing because I don't value material things like that to that degree. Okay. And so really what, just what I was asking you is, did you tell detectives that you were missing a pair of black cotton gloves? Or do you just not remember? Because I it's don't me? remember. Sir. Okay, sir. Now let's move to the mask, okay? You did tell police that you were missing a ski mask. Yes. Okay. And at some point, you permit police to look in Michael's room to and to search the house for a black ski Absolutely. mask. Absolutely, yes. And you helped look for the ski mask. Too. I didn't help look. I just you know, permitted them to do it because there were, it was two of them. Okay. And I don't, as I said, uh, I have I have ski masks. <clears throat> it just, sir, it, if you could just answer my question. What were you saying? With regard to the ski mask, was a ski mask ever located? Yes, it was. The ski, the police located a no, ski mask? No, no. Okay, so this, the police looked for a ski mask they didn't find. But it was there. Okay, but it was there. Yes. And that's the first time right now in 2023 is the first time you've ever said that. Isn't that right? I can't say that. My wife and I have talked about it when she did laundry. The ski mask was still there, and I wore it to another job site that I went to, Bellagio. You talked about this with Vita? You yes. talked about the mask? Yes. Okay. Now, this mask that you said was missing had a big, large mouthpiece. That's what you said, right? Right. And two holes for the eyes. No, not two holes. <clears throat> they were oblong. <clears throat> In other words, like, like this, whereas the eyes could be stretched over to the other part of your, your head where you could just have visibility. Do you remember being asked by the police in... This is the statement you made mm -hmm. right after Michael was killed. And when I say it, within a day, okay? Do you remember the police came to your house? Yes or no? Yes, they came, and it was more like three days because we were missing him for about three days. <clears throat> okay. If I showed you the date of your statement, would that refresh your memory as to when it was? To what was the question? I'm sorry. If I showed you a copy of your statement, would that help refresh your memory as to what day you actually gave the interview? Compared to when he was killed? 
Yes, we could get the date if we if you give me both, it. please. <clears throat> Pardon me. Give me both dates, if you don't mind. Sure. It, it appears he was killed on May eighth, two thousand and eight. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to show you your transcribed statement so you could see the date. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. Can I approach? If, if you could, sir, just look at this transcript. You see how this is, appears to be a transcript of you being interviewed with your wife by mm -hmm. the police. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And if you could look at the date. Do you see the date and the time, sir? 10.30 in the morning. And do you see the, the day? Yes. Okay. So it's actually... May 9th. May 9th. Right. I see that. Yes. Okay. So, <coughs> so it's been a long time. Uh, but it, it appears that uh, within a day, the police are interviewing you. I'm sorry, within a day of what? What are you saying within a day of what? Explain that. You asked when Michael was killed. Do you remember that? And I'm just saying within a day of Michael being killed, mm -hmm. you're giving an interview to the police. Okay? Does that make sense? It, it does and it doesn't. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> no, sir. No, sir. Please okay. just answer my question. Just go with the date. Today, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. May 9th. And they asked you about a ski mask. The police did, if you were missing a ski mask. Do you remember that? Yes. And they asked you, they described to you what they were looking for with the ski mask. And they said it would have had holes cut out for the eyes and maybe one for the mouth. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. And you said, I've had one over the years. It was black and had cutouts for the eyes and then the mouth, and you could pull it down, your mouth would be exposed. Does that seem fair? Yes, that's fair. Okay. And, and then you say, yes, it had a big opening for the mouth. It did. Okay. And you said you haven't um, had an opportunity to use it recently. Isn't that what you said? Yeah, it wasn't cold enough. <laughs> fair, it's May, right? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. And... So could you just describe for the jury just the mouthpiece? How big was this mouthpiece? The mouthpiece was um, able to stretch over your mouth and your nose if you chose to. W was there a hole so that you could breathe through it? Oh, yeah. And was this a big hole? It was. Would, if you put it on, would it expose a lot of your face? It was... Uh, a very high quality um, mask that you could wear and you could stretch it over <clears throat> or pull it down on your chin if you chose to. So you could pull it all the way down if yes. you wanted to. Yes, you chose to, right. But well, one thing you know about this mask, the mask that was shown to you mm -hmm. right now by Mr. Hamner, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that it had something tied up sort of in the mouthpiece area. Did you see that? I saw that. That was not mine. That wasn't yours. Oh, no. Because yours most certainly wasn't <clears throat> like no, that, no, it? no. And the eyes weren't like that either. Okay. <clears throat> and did the police ever ask you for a sample of your DNA? Like do a swab just to see if they could locate your DNA on gloves or a mask? If they did, I don't remember that. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. With regard to these lengthy conversations you've described, mm -hmm. right? You said they were hours. Remember saying that? Yes. Is today, strike that. Did you talk to the prosecution about these conversations at the mailbox? Yes, I did. Did you talk to the prosecution recently about this? Did you go to the prosecutor's office? You know what I mean by the prosecutor, right? I know that. Okay. Yeah. And did you talk to them and say, hey, you know, there were these hour-long conversations and they said that they were going to ask you about it? Do you remember that? No, it was not that way. Okay. Did, I guess what I'm asking you is, did you talk to the prosecutors about these conversations at the mailbox? I talked to the uh, police about that conversation, those conversations. When they came to interview me, they were homicide detectives. They weren't police, they were homicide detectives. And are you saying that you told police in your statement that there were these hours-long conversation by mailbox, by the mailbox? 
You're saying you told them that? Yeah, they interviewed me later, and I said, yes, that's exactly what it was. It was ours. You said they interviewed you later. Was it after this statement? I'm sure it was. Because I had to go down and pick up his, his things, his um, personal items. So it's fair to say that in your statement you gave, the recorded statement to the police, you didn't mention this, but at some point later you told police about this. Is that right? Yes. And then you came to a prior proceedings and you testified, didn't you? I did. And you didn't mention that there either, did you? What was that? About these hours-long conversations that lasted hours out by the mailbox. You didn't mention it. If I didn't mention it, it wasn't asked. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> Talk for hours at the mailbox? Yes. Okay, you had stated that you, you, you don't believe you were ever asked. Is that correct? That's what I believed. Counsel, I'm referring to the prior <coughs> proceeding. 110 lines 13 through 16. 13 through 16. I want you to see this line here, line 13 through 16. Should I read that? Well, okay. I'll, read it oh, in okay. I'll, I'll read it in a second. Your testimony... Just now, as you don't recall, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. That's it. So, prior testimony was years ago at a prior proceeding when you were asked. You didn't remember if you were asked that question. Yes. As you sit here today and had a chance to review that, is that statement correct? It was, I did. I did see it. I do remember okay. saying it. I'm going <clears throat> for the completeness of the record. I'm now going to read from page 110, line 13. Question: Would it be daily? Almost daily. What would you say? Answer: Well, it would go in spurts. Sometimes it would be maybe a day or two in between, and then sometimes it was like every day and for hours at the mailbox. So you were asked before, correct? Yes. And you did tell at a prior proceeding. Yes, I did. But they talked for hours. Yes. Okay. Do you remember the question on cross-examination about if any gloves went missing? Yes. Okay. Speaking, speaking of clothing, do you remember, do you remember telling the police uh, the day after all this happened that Mike had a red sweatshirt and some brown cowboy boots? Yes, he did. Do you remember who you told provided the red sweatshirt and the cowboy boots to Mike? Uh, and if you don't recall, I can help refresh your memory. Refresh my memory. Okay. Because, uh, like I said, I don't, I don't value clothes. Okay. I know, it's 15 years ago, it's a long time. Yeah. Give me one second. Referring to page 14, counsel. Showing you page 14. I want you to look at this question. Read this question, this answer. Read this, read this, and read this. Mm -hmm. Does this refresh your memory? Yes, it does. Okay. <coughs> so, now that your memory is refreshed, did you tell the police that Mike owned a red hooded sweatshirt? He did. Did you tell the police that he owned some brownish red boots? Yes. Did you tell the police who he got them from? He got them. Yes, I did. Who did he get them from? I said he got them from Tom. <clears throat> and did you tell them the last time you saw Mike wearing the red hooded sweatshirt? And if you need your memory refreshed, you can do that. It's okay. I can't remember that. It's okay. It's all right. It's a long time ago. Too detailed. <clears throat> sure. Okay. Read this and see if it refreshes your memory. But the last time you saw Mike wearing the red hooded sweatshirt. Yes. <clears throat> Did you say to the police on that day? It was. It was three days because we thought he was just going out. 
America three days ago. Yes. Gave that interview on May 9th of 2008. Right. Which would have put that three days prior, May 6th of 2008, right? Yes. Right. And your nephew passes away on May 8th, 2008. Is that right? Right. Finally, there were a lot of questions about the ski mask, right? Yes. Just to be clear, you saw that ski mask in I that bag over that. there? I did. That ain't the one, is it? I wouldn't wear that. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Yes, sir. You indicated that there were some brownish red boots and that they were given to Michael by Tom, That's right? What you said. And you have said that before in your original statement, right? Yes. Okay. With regard to the red hooded sweatshirt, didn't you actually say that you had seen Michael with that, but you don't say that that Tom gives it to, to That's him? That's what he said. Okay. Kent, I'm going to show him page 14. May I approach you? Let's go through this line by line. Okay. Let me see if I'm reading this correct. Okay. Okay. The pol see when I when I show you Q, that's questioned by the police. I got it. And BM, that's you, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So Mike have uh, a red hooded sweatshirt question, and you answer yes. Yes. Right. And when was the last time you saw that? And you say maybe three days ago. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And then they say, how about some boots? Right. And you, is that a yes? Yes, a yes. <clears throat> and you say he had brownish red boots, right? Yes. And where did he get those from? And you say from Tom. Yes. Okay. That ski mask that you've looked at, when was the was the first time you'd ever looked? at that ski mask was 2017? Uh, Let me ask it another way. I'll do the same. The police never showed you this ski mask, did they? I don't think I've ever seen that before. But but you know, like I said, it's so it's so inferior to the mask that I have, you know, that I would wear. Mr. Miller. Yes. The police never showed you that, correct? Not they never that. showed you that mask no. that you Okay. Thank you very much. That You're welcome. Okay. Any Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> At what time do you remember Mike leaving your house on May 8th of 2008? That was the day before he passed? That was the day that he passed, his May 8th. Okay. What I can say to that is 
Mike was missing for three days. That's unusual for him. Okay. No call, no, no show. So he was missing for three days? Three days. That. That's why it was concerning to me that uh, the police would show up three days later. Okay. I'm sorry, the homicide detective said we're homicide. And me and my wife was just like, okay. you know. Sir, do you remember what type of gun did Tom want Mike to get familiar with? It was a small black handgun, maybe like um, maybe like a nine millimeter, uh, fit into your hand, but you know, bigger than um, the kind that was um, that you would put in a waistband, but big enough, say you would go shooting, you could maybe take down a target or two. And it was it was a semi-automatic. Let's put it that way. It wasn't a it wasn't a revolver. Okay. On the night of May 8, 2008, was your bicycle missing? If it was in my garage, I wouldn't. I would not, I've never been asked that question on, on my bike's missing because I don't have a bike missing out of my garage even to this day. Okay. Mr. Hammond, any follow up based on your questions? Mr. Orm? Yes, sir. Do you remember the police asked you mm -hmm. in the interview when was the last time you had seen, or if you saw Mike yesterday, that's what they asked you. So on the 9th, they were asking you if you saw him on the 8th. Yes. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember that. You don't remember the question? I don't remember that question being asked of me. Okay. Uh, if I showed you, well, you said that you had not seen him yesterday. I hadn't seen him yesterday. I hadn't seen him in three days. That's why I was concerned that they would show up and ask. So your wife was present in the interview with yes. you, right? And she said she'd seen him yesterday. Okay. Remember that? I don't remember saying that. We never talked about that. I don't want to mislead you. I, you didn't say it. Your wife said it. Do you remember her saying that in front of you? Objection to hearsay and relevance? I'm just going to allow you. Sir, do you remember if you heard your wife say that? No, I don't. Okay. If I showed you a copy of the statement, would it refresh your memory? If, 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 uh, if my wife said it. <clears throat> Hold on just one second. Mr. Holmes, that is hearsay that his wife said it. He, he asked him if he remembers her saying it. He doesn't remember it. That's fine. Yeah. It was stressful times. <clears throat> yes. Anything else, Mr. Hammond? Uh, no, you're on. Right. We're ready to adjourn. Do you have any further questions? Okay. Ready to write down a full sheet of paper with your name and your juror number? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point we are going to take our night recess. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including government jurors, in any way regarding this case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or the means of communication or social media. You must not read or listen to any news or media accounts or commentary about the case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using reference materials. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate any aspect of the case, or any other way to investigate or learn about the case on your own. You must not form or express any opinion regarding this case, so it's fine submitted to you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be in recess until tomorrow at 1 p.m. I do have it's something I have to do in the morning, so we will be here at 1 p.m. tomorrow, so we will resume at that time. All right? All rise for the jury.